A treaty to regulate global arms trade comes into effect. Its supporters are hailing it as a new chapter. But just how will it be implemented and will it make a difference with armed conflicts continuing to take the lives of many around the world? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. The world is awash with lethal weapons. In conflict areas like Syria, Iraq and Libya, the existence and illegal flow of weapons has been a big driver of instability. And though it's a multi-billion dollar industry, it is one that has operated with virtually no regulation. Supporters of the Arms Trade Treaty say that is about to change. As of Wednesday and following years of campaigning and lobbying by NGOs, the treaty has officially become into international law. It will for the first time put controls on national governments to help limit the flow of weapons to countries where they would be used to commit atrocities, war crimes or attack civilians. 130 countries have signed it but 70 of those have not yet ratified it. These include the US, by far the world's biggest exporter, and Israel, also another big player in the global weapons trade. While other big weapons traders like China, Russia and India have not signed on. As we've been saying, this is a lucrative industry worth somewhere in the region of $85 billion a year. And it's, of course, also a deadly one. Around half a million people are killed every year by firearms. The five permanent members of the UN Security Council, the United States of America, Russia, China, France and Britain are among the world's largest arms traders. While the world's largest importers include Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, India and Pakistan. So joining our discussion today in London, we have Martin Butcher. He is the policy advisor on arms and conflict at Oxfam. He's also the former NATO policy analyst for the Acronym Institute for Disarmament Diplomacy. In Geneva, Alexandre Vucevet, editor of the Swiss Military Review. And joining us via Skype is Kirk Jackson, coordinator of the Campaign Against Arms Trade. Good to have you all with us. Uh, lots to talk about here. Let's uh, start with uh, Martin uh, Butcher. Um, supporters of this treaty say that its implementation will make, make it much more difficult for uh, arms dealers to ship uh, deadly weapons to, to parties in conflicts like uh, places like we mentioned there, Syria, South Sudan and other hotspots in, in the Middle East and Africa. Is that what you believe? Yes, that's right. Um, Oxfam, together with... Uh, the 100 or so other NGOs in the Control Arms Coalition have been campaigning for this treaty, as you said, for many years. We're very pleased that it's entering into force today. We're very, that uh, 60 countries have already ratified, 130 have signed. What those countries will now be doing is putting into national law regulations to control the import and export of arms and to allow them to account for the weapons that they have uh, and all, all of these measures, together with reporting and uh, the discussion of problems at conferences of states' parties, will allow us slowly and gradually to reduce the irresponsible arms trade and to reduce the flow of arms into the illicit market. Alexander Vucevic, the, the proof of this uh, arms trade treaty will be in its enforcement, won't it? The, on the countries willing to abide by it and hold other countries to account for breaches. Yes, definitely. There is a parallel to the uh, signing of this uh, treaty, and that is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we have a, an extraordinary treaty, if you will. We have uh, very good intentions. We have international norms and standards, but we don't really have an implementation. And there is nobody really responsible for the implementation of this treaty at the moment. Kirk Jackson, you, you, you've called this uh, treaty a, a historic and momentous failure. Just explain to us why you believe that. Um, I think on paper it looks like this treaty is, is a great thing. But if you actually look at uh, what we've ended up with, it's actually a very weak treaty with a lot of loopholes. Um, the threshold for stopping arms transfers are too high. It's up to countries themselves to decide whether or not they're going to block an arms transfer. <clears throat> and worse still, it actually the text of it actually legitimises the arms trade 
and and so we think it's it's actually uh, on balance uh, uh, not a good thing. Let's put that point then to Martin uh, Butcher. Is this a, a weak treaty with too many loopholes in it? The, the treaty is a framework. It, it sets out the measures of international humanitarian law and human rights law that have to be respected by the state's parties. It sets out how they have to apply those in measuring whether or not to make an arms transfer. Um, and then it, it, it applies those uh, criteria to transfers of everything from battleships um, down to small arms and light weapons and, and their ammunition. Um, the uh, the treaty provides a framework that states have to put in their own national laws. Those, those laws obviously are enforceable in their courts, but then the states have to report uh, on what they've done to implement the treaty and on the arms imported and exported over the course of the past year. And at a conference of states' parties, these reports can be debated um, and uh, challenges can be made by states to other states over problems. We've never had an international forum like this. We, we don't yet know um, exactly how this will work. Those rules are being worked out at the moment. What we do know is that, that states and industry and civil society all working together um, now have a mechanism to rein in the irresponsible arms trade, something which, on the global scale at least, has never existed before. Alexandra Vucevic, does this uh, treaty address the issues of transparency, who, who the end user is and where the arms are ultimately going to go? Well, I think we, we heard this. It, uh, the, this treaty puts the burden uh, of the responsibility and of the decision-making on the national governments that are going to have to decide whether or not to authorize these exports. But of course, as we've uh, also heard, this treaty does not ban the commerce of weapons. And the best uh, legitimizing uh, uh, treaty uh, in order to uh, uh, legitimize the, the arms uh, production, uh, sale, export is uh, the UN Charter itself, because the United Nations uh, considers that it is the right uh, of every single uh, country uh, to ensure its own self-defense. So this particular treaty is not going to harm, it's not going to impede the legitimate uh, arms trade, it's going to continue to remain a very lucrative business, but of course the aim is to reduce uh, some, of the, uh, some of the problems that have been associated with irresponsible uh, sales or lack of control, and in particular I insist on this, it will build an international standard, international norms of best practices uh, with regards to arms exports. Uh, Kirk Jackson, does this uh, treaty at least establish a, a kind of ethical decision-making uh, framework for the, for the global arms trade? Uh, what it does is uh, it allows uh, the major arms exporting states, uh, such as the UK and the US, and the major arms companies to claim that they're complying with uh, an arms trade treaty that's been drawn up by some of the world's leading humanitarian organizations. But unfortunately, beyond that, it won't actually, it's very, very hard to see how it could have any effect. Countries such as the UK already, uh, we, we hear all the time from UK ministers and civil servants uh, who are in the business of promoting arms exports, uh, often to repressive regimes that Britain, uh, whenever they're challenged, they say Britain has one of the uh, most rigorous arms control, uh, arms exports uh, regimes uh, in the world. And on paper, this is true, um, but it's routinely ignored. And the thing about the arms trade treaty is it's actually no stronger than those existing uh, regulations that some of the world's largest arms exporters have. And if they don't make a difference, then what makes us think that the arms trade treaty is going to? Um Martin Butcher, uh, this, this treaty is going to run into some opposition in the United States, as I'm sure you know, the gun rights lobby in the, in the US, the NRA, very much opposed uh, to this, citing the, the, the constitutional right to bear arms. And now that we, we're going to have a Republican Congress uh, in, in Washington from, from January, how important is it that the US, the world's biggest arms exporter, uh, is able to ratify this? Well, you're right. The, there are problems in the United States. The, the gun lobby, the NRA uh, and their allies are opposed to the treaty, although it has nothing to say about domestic gun legislation uh, of the kind that they support. This is all about the international trade in arms. 
Um, and again, you're right, the Republican Congress w will oppose ratification of the treaty. Um, we didn't expect um, quick ratification of the treaty by the US even before these election results. It's certainly not going to come for the next few years. Um, however, it is significant that the US has signed the treaty. Now it's entering into force. They're bound by the Vienna Convention on Treaty Law to do nothing to defeat the objects and purposes of the treaty. And um, since the treaty is a framework which has to be implemented in national law, it's also significant that the United States has already amended um, arms export rules there to allow for uh, the, the provisions of the treaty. So um, while the Republicans, the NRA and their allies are a problem, um, I'm pleased to say that the United States is already contributing to, the, to building the international humanitarian law norms um, enshrined in this treaty, which are very important. Alexandre Vochever, um, the belief is from, from supporters is that, that conflicts in the future like Syria's could be, could be starved of weapons by this arms trade uh, treaty. Uh, do, do you think realistically that could happen? I'm not so sure, because uh, the main reason why today so many weapons are available, so many tanks, uh, so many anti-tank uh, missiles, so many artillery pieces, um, unfortunately, uh, the main reason for this availability of weapon is disarmament. It's disarmament since the 1990s. And we're seeing this all over the world. Uh, even if we stopped uh, producing new weapons as of today, which, of course, is not going to happen, uh, there would still be an absolute absolutely immense stockpile available. Most of the weapons that are being used in Syria today, that are being used in, uh, in Libya, in Mali and elsewhere, these weapons were produced 20, 30, 40 years ago, and uh, perhaps some of them are, are still being produced in, uh, in countries that are definitely not the United States. So the availability of weapons is one of the problems, and it's only indirectly going to be addressed by this arms trade treaty. Um, Kirk Jackson, is it, was it realistic to expect that this, uh, that, that any sort of a, a, an arms trade uh, regulation of any kind would work when, when the biggest uh, players in, involved in that trade are, are the ones who are signing on to it? Um, in retrospect, perhaps it wasn't. I think uh, in the final year or so of the negotiations, um, in, in an attempt to bring the U.S. on board, because the U.S. was reluctant, uh, some very serious compromises were made. And uh, I think it was should have been quite clear in the final few months of negotiations that it wasn't going to be possible to salvage a strong treaty. And, uh, I mean, Oxfam had said themselves a weak treaty would be worse than no treaty. And so I think at that stage, uh, it would have been better for the large NGOs to uh, walk away from it so as to avoid lending it legitimacy uh, rather than to, to, to double down on it. All right, so let's get Martin Butcher's view on that. I mean, would it have better, been better if this turns out to be a very weak uh, treaty, a very weak framework? Would it have been better to have walked away? Um, we looked at that throughout the negotiations, whether we were contributing to a treaty that was, in our view, strong enough. And that was something which Oxfam again together with the whole Control Arms Alliance did regularly throughout the negotiations. And uh, coming back to your point about the availability of arms for conflict, um, it, we took the view that as a tool to be used over the coming decades, this was something that we could work with. The, for example, uh, China came under huge criticism uh, earlier this year for selling arms to South Sudan at a time when the country is riven by civil conflict and uh, also still engaged in low-level conflict, at least with its neighbours uh, in, in Sudan. And, um, the international outcry around that shipment of arms has made China cancel future shipments. That's an international norm enshrined in the ATT that is already working before the treaty came into force. And China you know, a country which hasn't even signed the treaty um, you know, can be persuaded not, not to sell arms into zones of conflict. So, you know, international pressure works, international norms work. It isn't quick, it's not a panacea to the world's conflicts, but over, over years it will definitely have an effect. 
All right, I want to put that point back to Kirk Jackson then. There, there, you know, I mean, as uh, Martin has just cited there, there are examples where enough international pressure can be brought to bear on, on certain countries and where it does work. What, what do you say to that? Well, first of all, I believe it was uh, Oxfam who, before the treaty was actually uh, uh, agreed in its final form, said that um, in, in an effort to, to get the strong treaty that they had originally wanted, said that uh, uh, treaties that start out weak rarely become strong over time. And that, that's a, a quote from Oxfam himself. Um, and if we're going to talk examples, there's uh, the UK um, uh, home to one of the world's largest arms companies, BAE Systems, um, regularly export equipment, fighter jets to repressive regimes, uh, Saudi Arabia, Israel, Bahrain. Uh, recently, UK uh, tear gas was... <clears throat> used in Hong Kong. And uh, when uh, BA systems and, and, and the uh, government have already said that the arms trade treaty will make no difference whatsoever, it won't be any more difficult uh, for companies to acquire arms from the UK or for British based arms companies to sell arms to regimes, to countries that are even on the foreign, uh, foreign offices list of countries of human rights concern. Yeah, Alexandra uh, Vucevic, in, in addition to what Kirk Jackson has, has said there, that major weapons uh, producers uh, like Russia and China, as we mentioned earlier, India, Pakistan, none of them have signed on to this treaty. How effective will it be then without them taking part? I think in the case of uh, Russia and China, it's probably best that they not sign this treaty, and this is probably going to be extremely good uh, for their uh, sales in the uh, coming months and coming years, because, of course, uh, this means that uh, a lot of the shipments, uh, a lot of the um, uh, availability of weapons to some of the regimes, to some of the countries, to some of the armed groups uh, that are uh, most uh, uh, eager to plan or to be a part of armed conflict in the, uh, in, the, in the near future, uh, of course, they will have uh, their uh, certain suppliers in the form of Russia, India, and, uh, and China. So I think that uh, it's one of the things that we simply have to accept. And here again, international norms uh, are set, and this treaty will certainly be brought to bear against those countries by the international community. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great world of international relations and politics around the UN Security Council. You can see that every day about Ukraine, about uh, Syria, and just like other treaties, uh, the fact that some countries have decided not to sign is not going to shield them completely from criticism. Yeah, um, Martin Butcher, I mean, it, these treaties are only as, as good as, as their weakest links in, in many ways. Um, if, if, you know, the, the view is among many people that it'll, this, this will just kind of shift the trade uh, elsewhere to, to, the, to the countries that are not uh, b bound by it. What do you say to that? Well, there may well be an effect that um, some countries which, you know, wish to continue um, abusing the human rights of their citizens uh, look to countries that are outside the ATT uh, norms for, to, to purchase arms. But um, with two-thirds of the world's countries already having signed up for the treaty, um, we can look forward to, to a time when that group of countries that is outside is, is very, shr very shrunken. Um, we've uh, s seen um, you know, Israel and, and Zimbabwe sign the treaty in recent days. Neither of those countries um, have particularly good human rights records. They're now um, you know, signed into a regime where, for the first time, as I've said, you know, we're able to challenge their actions and challenge the, uh, the sales of arms by other countries to them. And Kurt raised the, the question of UK arms sales to Israel. That's something that Oxfam has challenged strongly this year with our Control Arms UK colleagues, um, Safer World and Amnesty, um, and something which, um, you know, due to the work of Control Arms and to the uh, campaign against the arms trade, the British government is now, um, you know, being forced to reconsider that policy. Um, so, uh, you know, while yes, there are going to be gaps, yes, there, is, there are going to continue to be arms sales that we wouldn't want to see, um, what we've got here is an international law framework that over time will allow us to 
transform the global situation um, in the irresponsible and illicit arms markets. Kirk Jackson, what do you say to that? Well, the thing is, um, most arms trade uh, transfers in the world uh, are not in the, the black market, the illegitimate uh, the market that uh, this, this uh, trade is supposed to be stopping. They're, they're what the trade would recognise as being legitimate arms transfers. And um, I think we've got to look at what's in it for the, uh, the countries such as Israel to sign up in the UK and the US, and what's in it for the arms industry. I mean, I think it's quite telling that today we've got uh, arms companies coming on saying how good it is that they've got an arms trade treaty. What is it they're getting out of it? Well, you know, they're in the business of making money. They see it as creating a level playing field. They've got to go through some uh, uh, paperwork in the UK and they want other uh, countries to, to have to have the same sort of level. Um, but countries like, uh, I mean, Israel, um, what countries are seeing it as a foreign policy tool where they can still continue to get the weapons that they want to use because they don't really see the treaty as stopping them because it's the threshold is, is not that high for, for stopping arms exports. Um, whilst at the same time they would like to deny their, uh, uh, their, their sort of uh, countries they're not on good terms with. And in the case of Israel, um, maybe they're hoping to benefit from the fact that the arms trade treaty represents the right of states to acquire weapons. Uh, but uh, non-state actors like the Palestinians, of course, uh, they're hoping to uh, uh, deny them weapons. Alex Danzer, Votrever, is this, um, at least in your view, a step in the right direction? And, and what improvements do you think could be made uh, in the future to, to, in terms of the, this uh, regulating or uh, the arms trade? Definitely, it's a, it's a step forward because uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, there have been great progresses with disarmament, non-proliferation in the realm of strategic nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, basically weapons of mass destruction. But this framework, these successes have always been bilateral. Um, since the 1970s, we have tried many different things uh, with regards to conventional arms. Uh, we're talking tanks, uh, ships, and and so on and so forth. We've tried uh, to regulate small arms, and so far this multilateral uh, negotiating scheme to try and, and limit the possession and the use of small arms and conventional weapons uh, has been relatively unsuccessful. So I think it's a, it's a step in the right direction that we have this uh, treaty. It actually is going to reinforce other treaties that, uh, and conventions that already exist. I'm thinking in particular of the Ottawa uh, Convention that bans uh, uh, landmines, anti-personnel landmines, and the uh, uh, Dublin uh, uh, Convention, which uh, which prohibits uh, the use of uh, cluster munitions. So I think that we're we're going in the right direction, and certainly there is now a framework on which new negotiations, new discussions to ban perhaps certain weapons uh, can can now uh, can now make progress. All right, Martin Butcher, I'll give you uh, what's probably going to be the last word here. Um, well, I think that mentioning those two conventions, landmines and cluster munitions, um, Alexander is absolutely right. I mean, the, those set global norms, which you know even the U.S., Russia, and China, who stand outside them, have respected. Um, we'll work, um, you know, with our colleagues in 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 civil society, with industry, with governments, um, to make sure over the coming years that this framework lives up to its promise in controlling the arms trade and in reducing the humanitarian harm that irresponsible and illicit arms deals have caused up to now. All right, and on that note, we're going to have to leave it. Thank you to all three uh, of our guests, Martin Butcher, Alexander uh, Vuchever, and um, Kirk uh, Jackson joining us there via Skype. And you can find this show and many more on our website. As always, that's aljazeera.com. You can post your comments at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story or contact us on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. That's it for another show. I'm Hazem Seeker. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.